Apparently not. Right. I've used some other systems internally where you click it and then it's like you got to wait until you know the hamster wheel starts turning. Uh huh. Again, I'm getting so used to Zoom all of a sudden and it does it. You just click it and it starts. And yeah. I guess maybe they're just getting better at it. And I guess that's one thing. We are fortunate that this is happening in this day and age where we have all these tools. Mm -hmm. you know, if you think 20 years ago, 30 years ago, would have just, I don't know what you would have done. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and we talk about some of the downsides of, of, of sort of social media and connectedness, but it's been a godsend right now, both for teaching, but just staying in touch with people. Yeah. Agreed. Mm -hmm. All right, for those who just joined, we'll get started in about two minutes, I think. We have a lot of people joining up right now. Sounds good. We'll give it another minute or two and then get going. Thank you all for who are already on here for joining up early. Appreciate that. All right, well, it's a minute past by my clock here, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, first off, I just wanna welcome everybody who's with us on the line. Um, no sound. Someone just chatted and said no sound. Is everybody else able to hear right now or do we have issues all around? Well, you I can. can you're able to hear me correctly, right, Jim? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Okay, it seems like we're doing all right. Maria, it must be something on your end. Others seem to be able to hear right now. So I'm sorry about that. Um, if you chat me privately once we get going, I, I may be able to help troubleshoot this, but I'm not exactly sure what's happening on your end. Um, my name is Will Moore. I handle marketing for the Life Sciences Division here at Macmillan Learning. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us today, for taking the time. I know everybody is busy right now with these uh, these times we're going through. So I wanna introduce uh, Dr. Jim Morris from Brandeis University in the biology department. He is also the author of our How Life Works textbook. And um, I will let him take it from here. So Jim, take it away. Okay, thanks, Will. And let me give it, begin by um, echoing what Will, Will said. Um, thank you so much for joining, uh, joining Will and me um, for this webinar. It was turning out to be a really challenging time. I mean, I know the pandemic has upended, you know, all of our lives and in no small part because in no small part because um, we have to take our classes which we de we designed as in-person classes and we have to turn them to online classes so it's funny because or ironic because i originally when i was putting this together called this um, webinar including everybody in the classroom or including everyone in the classroom but i probably should have called it and my computer just froze um, excuse me a second. I'm going to have to pause for a second. The, the slide's not advancing. 
I got it. I fixed it. So I probably, instead of calling it including everyone in the classroom, I should have called it including everyone in the classroom and online because now I'm teaching online and I imagine many of you are too. And it's one thing to design a class for online, but it's a, another thing entirely to design a class in person and then have to switch it suddenly online. Um, a lot of the deans and administration are calling it a pivot to online, but I'm thinking of it more like a leap. For example, I'm teaching um, comparative vertebrate anatomy and we have a really strong hands-on component dissections. And of course, that has all gone out to window and I have to rethink it. Um, but it's actually interesting to be talking about this topic of inclusive teaching in the age of online because online presents certain challenges um, that are particular to the online environment. For example, now we have to think about what time zones our students are in. We have to think about whether they have computer access. We have to think about um, what kind of Wi-Fi they, ha they have. Um, we have to think about what their home or living situation is and whether it is um, conducive to learning. So this is not a talk about online technology or online learning. It's really a talk about inclusive teaching practices. And I'll try to toggle between the physical classroom and the virtual classroom because for all of us, it's getting more relevant. Um, I also wanna say at the outset, I guess two other things. I call this including everybody or including everyone. But, but the topic, if you sort of look it up, is called inclusivity. And, and again, thinking about this talk, I wanted to look up what does inclusivity actually mean? And what, there's, a, there's a funny or interesting aspect of it because inclusivity, it turns out, is not, not the standard word or not even a real word. The noun form is inclusiveness. The reason why people are starting to use the word inclusivity is that it rhymes and echoes diversity. And I think all of you know that our classrooms are getting more and more diverse. And, and, it, and diversity is clearly not enough. It's not enough just to have a diverse classroom if you're not reaching everyone. So um, this topic of inclusivity, including a diverse classroom is becoming more and more relevant. And, and the last thing I wanna say before we kind of get started is, I'm not an expert in this area. I'm an instructor very much like you. I teach at Brandeis University. Brandeis University is a liberal arts college and research university located out of Boston. Every year I teach introductory biology and in intro bio, I have 350 students, which is a large class for a school like Brandeis. And probably like you, I've noticed that my, over the last 10, 15, 20 years, my classes are becoming increasingly diverse and diverse in so many different ways, diverse in terms of socioeconomic status, um, um, gender identity, um, racial identity, ethnic identity, um, levels of preparedness, where people are from, it's just diverse in so many different ways. And so, um, so I guess I'm met with the challenge of how do I include this increasing diverse population of students? And so I'm gonna approach this very much as an instructor, teaching a large classroom, very much like you, and some of the, the techniques that I'm starting to employ to make sure I'm reaching everybody. All right, so with that said, um, I'm gonna ask a series of questions, which is sort of ironic because I'm in a webinar setting. But the first thing I wanna start with is what may be an obvious question, which is why, why be inclusive? Now I say that's obvious or simple because we're all teachers, we're all instructors. And of course we wanna reach all of our students. A colleague of mine always says that teaching is essentially a social endeavor. You're making connections um, with students. So of course we wanna reach everybody. But the reason why I put up that question is that the literature has shown that if you create an inclusive classroom, you're not just reaching everybody, you're doing other things as well. For example, you're, you're reducing the achievement gap. You're generating stronger interest in science. And perhaps most importantly, you're fostering a sense of community or identity. And I say that that's perhaps most important because it's most important in the sciences because one of the best predictors for success in science is whether people view themselves as a quote unquote science person. And that begins right in the science classroom. So we've all heard that I'm a science person or I'm not a science person. And, and if, if students start to think of themselves as not a science person, they don't take the next science class or they don't read the science section of the paper or they don't go on in science. So we have sort of a special role to be inclusive in the classroom so everybody feels like that they can do it. And, and I think that sense of belonging, community identity is particularly important therefore in the sciences. So what does it mean to be inclusive? What, what does inclu inclusive teaching um, look like? There's a graphic going around the web that's meant to sort of 
capture the idea of inclusiveness. And it looks like this. Um, it begins like this. This is three students, three children trying to watch a baseball game and they're looking over a fence. And what the first graphic is supposed to show is what happens when you treat everybody equally. When you treat everybody equally, some people still can't see the game. So instead, people are advocating instead for inclusive teaching pra practices or, or, or treating everybody equitably. And treating everybody equitably looks like this. Instead of giving everybody the same thing, you give everybody what they need in order to see the game or to participate in the class. Now, if you actually have been following this graphic along, there's a lot of criticism on the web as well about it. Some people have asked, why is there a fence there to begin with? And so there's another graphic which extends this even further, which says we should be moving the barriers and are calling that liberation. And again, if you're following this, some people are even critical of this because it's placing the onus of these differences on the students when, or on the people, when in fact, um, equally to blame or another area to look at our sort of structural things in our classroom, in the way we teach, differences among schools and the like. And I'm not gonna get into all that. I show, so why am I showing you these graphics in spite of some of the criticism? I think it helps to frame the discussion. I think the middle panel or the right panel is really what we're talking about. How can we give students what they need? How can we um, treat them equitably? How can we rem remove barriers? And how can we create a classroom where everybody can in fact watch the game or, or more importantly participate in, in learning? So where should we be inclusive? It's clear we need to be inclusive everywhere. Again, if you read the literature on this, this goes well beyond the classroom. People start by talking about the campus and the class campus should have a culture of inclusiveness. And that has to do with the dorms and the extracurricular activities and the sports and the students and kind of just the general culture of the classroom. That is such a big topic. And I just put that there to say, I'm aware of that. It's something we should all be thinking about but that's not gonna be the focus of this webinar. What's gonna be the focus of the webinar is how can we be inclusive within the classroom, whether we're talking about a physical classroom or a virtual classroom. So let's focus just on that. And the rest of the time I'd like to think, and probably the reason why you joined this webinar to begin with is what can we do? How can we create a, an inclusive cl classroom? And again, what I'm gonna share with you are both some small and bigger ways that I've been working on it. And I'd love to at the end hear what you're doing as well. I'm beginning with a blank slide because this is just to remind me that we can be more inclusive by making very small changes. There's some small things that we can do that can make a huge difference. And some of these things are really obvious and that you're probably doing all the time already, but they include things like, um, like um, introducing yourself. Um, maybe sharing something personal about yourself if you're comfortable. A really powerful one that's relatively simple is just knowing everybody's names. And you, knowing and using their names can make a big difference for people feeling included, for making them feel seen and making them feel heard. Now, of course, in large classrooms, that's really hard. Um, I can do about 100. If I have 100 students, I can sort of by mid-semester, I know everybody's name. When I have 350 students, I can't, but I've, come up with ways to sort of use their names. I ask people if they're gonna ask a question to say their name first. And so we're always kind of using names in the classroom. And I found that that makes a big difference. And the last kind of little thing that you can do is, um, is, is when students come into the classroom is to say hi. Um, as opposed to, I know I teach an 8 a.m. class and sometimes people will come in and just take their seat and I always make sure to say good morning or hello. I know those are really small ways, but those small things can make a tremendous difference. There's one other kind of little trick, it's not a trick, I actually don't want to call it a trick, a technique, a strategy. And this came from my, my wife. My wife is an elementary school teacher. She teaches kindergarten. And one of the things that they talk about extensively in kindergarten, but actually I've never really heard it talked about at the college level, is this concept of windows and mirrors. Um, evidently it's talked about all the time at this level. Windows and mirrors is a concept or a strategy that was developed by um, Emily Style. And Emily Style is from the National SEED Network. SEED stands for Seeking, uh, Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity. And what she argues is or promotes is the idea that with any resource or any story or any figure or anything you're gonna do in the classroom, think about it for every student, will that be a window for them or will it be a mirror for them? And what do I mean by those terms? 
a mirror is something that um, reflects your own culture and helps to build your own identity. And a window, of course, is a view into somebody else's experience. And of course, we want a balance. We don't want everything to be a mirror um, and just to be about them. But we don't want everything to be windows either, something that people can't relate to. There has to be this balance between windows and mirrors. And I've actually started to think about when I show a figure or I tell a story or I design, talk about an experiment, um, for how many students is this going to be a window or a mirror? Let me just give you just a quick just example just to show what I'm talking about, because things don't have to be either a window or a mirror. Sometimes they can be both. I'll take myself as a learner and I'll just bring up Charles Darwin because I teach evolution. What is Charles Darwin to me? Well, in many ways, he's a mirror, of course, right? He's um, a white male interested in natural history and evolution. And I can relate to all of those things. But, you know, there's aspects of him, of course, that are windows, that he's a window for me in my experience, right? He's British, I'm American. You know, you think of him as an older man. I like to think of myself as younger. Um, what else? Did I already say this? He lived in England. He married his first cousin. I didn't. So there's there's many ways that a single thing can be a, a window and a mirror. And it just it forces us to think or encourages us to think with any example, are we only presenting windows to some students and to make sure that we have a balance? Um, I brought this up at a workshop we recently had in, in Denver, and one of the participants talked about um, just strategies for teaching biology. And I talked about it like a language. And he said he talks about it like cooking. And somebody else said they talk about it like learning sports. And I was thinking about all those stories because what's great about having a diverse way of telling that was that some people will, will relate to sports or to cooking or to languages. And depending on the example, it might be a mirror for some. And another example might be a mirror for somebody else. So again, those are all simple things, um, names, windows, and mirrors introductions that I think play a big role. But what I thought I'd do for the rest of the webinar is concentrate on three larger areas that are have been shown and demonstrated to promote an inclusive classroom. And the first one is having an active classroom. So in other webinars, and I'm sure you've seen that um, teaching actively is a really effective way of teaching in terms of of learning and in terms of retention. And it's it's been really well documented now that it can have really good and strong um, learning outcomes for students over pa a passive classroom. And I'm not gonna talk about that here. What I wanna talk about instead is the role that an active classroom can play in promoting an inclusive classroom and making people feel, students feel, um, a, a real sense of belonging and identity. And instead of talking about active teaching, I'm gonna actually share with you uh, an activity I've done where everybody is involved and everybody seems to get it. And I think it's kind of therefore provides a good example of how an active classroom can get everybody involved. The example I'm gonna give is a game that I developed along with some colleagues of mine at a summer institute um, that I did a several years ago. And the idea of this game was to teach the topic of altruism and specifically reciprocal altruism. And obviously here, I'm not gonna get into it, but very briefly, altruism, as you know, is simply the idea that I'm going to help you, um, but I'm going to take a hit. I'm going to help you at a cost to myself. And of course, altruism has been a special challenge for evolution because how can altruism evolve by natural selection if you're reducing your own fitness? And one of the solutions to the problem is something called reciprocal altruism. And reciprocal altruism was developed by Bob Trivers in Princeton. And he came up with very briefly the idea that altruism could evolve if there's opportunities for reciprocity, if there's a taking turns, if there's a bit of a back and forth, that is, I help you if you help me. And evidently, this kind of back and forth behavior has been well documented in things like um, birds that fly in V-shaped flocks. They take turns at the lead where they have to work harder. And most notably, they've been, it's been demonstrated in, in this organism, a vampire bat. Vampire bats do in fact go out, they get a blood meal, they fly back to their caves where they're unrelated nest mates. And it's been shown that they'll actually regurgitate blood to unrelated nest mates if in fact that nest mate in turn regurgitates to them on a future visit. Okay, so that's sort of the what I'm trying to get across. And I used to teach it this way. Um, this is the prisoner's dilemma. It comes from game theory. This is used in biology and economics. And it's a, a model for how reciprocal altruism plays out. And I'm not gonna explain it, and, but you can see from this slide, it's kind of complicated. There's two players, there's two strategies, there's a payoff grid, there's a little bit of math involved. And I have to say I did it, I was very proud of my teaching, but about, I don't know, 
a third to half of the students would answer questions right on the exam. So I clearly wasn't reaching everybody. And I'm sure some people, many people felt left off, left out by this example. So instead at the summer institutes, we came out with a really different way of teaching it. And this was a game, uh, something that students would do. So what I do is I hand out this to all my students. It's a game board. It's just on a sheet of paper. And you can see it looks kind of like checkers. And then what I would do is give the students the following directions. It would go like this. You, you take the game board, you find a partner, which is just the student sitting next to you, or if you're in an active classroom, others at your table. You put an object in the center spot. So you see the center spot there in the right corner. Um, and it could be a penny, I used to say, but nobody carries pennies anymore. So you could just rip off a piece of the paper and crumple it up and put it in the middle or, or whatever, put something in the center. And you have to want to win this game. You can't like give up or not be involved. And to win, you have to move the object, whatever it is, to your goal spot. You can see there's a goal spot at the top and the bottom, and your goal is just to get it to your goal spot. You have to take turns moving the object. So I'm going to move it, then you, then me, then you. And you can only move the object one circle at a time. You get 10 moves each, and you only get to play the game once. And remember, you really want to win. And then I just tell them to go. And they're not supposed to talk during this. Now, it's, it's ironic to do an active learning exercise online when you don't have the game board and can't play it with each other, but I think you could imagine what would happen, and I'll just play it out for you here. So we put it in the middle, I'll pull it towards me, then you pull it back towards your goal spot, then towards me, then towards you, then towards me, then towards you. And just like you, my students quickly learn about 10 seconds that this is an unwinnable game. You can't win this game. Um, and they figure that out very fast. So I just taught them what an unwinnable game is. Okay, then I say, okay, you guys, we're gonna play the exact same game and it's the exact same rules and we're only gonna change one of the rules. Instead of playing the game once, I'm gonna allow you to play it 10 times and every time you win, you're gonna get a prize or whatever it is. And then I just say, go. Um, and importantly in this, they're not supposed to talk, they're not supposed to communicate, they're not supposed to wink, they're not supposed to make deals, it's quiet. And this is what students quickly learn. In fact, any, they say any intelligent social creature will learn this. And it goes like this. I'm gonna let you win, but on the next run, you're gonna let me win. And it'll go back and forth like this. And what the students have discovered on their own very quickly, and I'd argue very intuitively, um, what they've just learned is the solution to the prisoner's dilemma, which is that you cooperate on the first move and then you do whatever the opponent did on the previous move. And what that has to get into is I'll go back for a second. Um, I'm going to let you win. You let me win. But let's say when it's my turn to win, you don't let me win. You win instead. And then I'm not going to let you win on your next turn. Um, but if you start cooperating, I'm going to start cooperating. And so that's the second part. Do what the opponent did on the previous move. What I love about this is it's quick, it's easy, and it's kind of a threshold effect. Students get it really quickly, they get it really well, and when I ask questions on the exam, everybody gets it. It's a really inclusive way of teaching. It's a very powerful way of teaching. Now, I imagine some of you might be asking, and I can't see the chat box, but does that mean I don't teach the prisoner's dilemma or that I don't teach the mathematical side of it? And actually, no, I just, I, I flip it. In other words, I do the activity, and then I use that to scaffold, to leverage the teaching of the prisoner's dilemma. So instead of starting with the prisoner's dilemma, I build to the prisoner's dilemma. Once people get the point, the prisoner's dilemma is actually a very simple allegory for it. So I haven't watered down my teaching in any way. In fact, I think I've, I've allowed more people ways to learn something that was leaving many of them out. And that's just one example. I've been finding many cases that an inclusive classroom um, gives people a real sense of empowerment. Oh. Um, I was going to say one more thing. So where do you find um, where do you where do you find um, active learning exercises that you can do in the classroom? They are everywhere. Um, there's a lot of books and there's a lot of free online resources that make um, active learning exercises available. Because I'm an author of How Life Works, I will just mention that in How Life Works, um, we have I think now 75 or 80 in-class activities that are very much aligned with the content and were developed, as it says, by instructors for instructors for use in the classroom. So that's one place you can get active learning exercises. What's the second strategy to be more inclusive? Um, again, this is from the literature, but it's been well known that a structured classroom is a more inclusive classroom. That if you provide more structure for every part of your classroom, you're first of all helping everybody and you'll disproportionately help people who struggle more, who are less well prepared, we're having a harder time following you. In other words, a structured classroom doesn't just reduce the achievement gap, but includes more people 
than an unstructured loose classroom. So what do I mean by structure or where can you find the structure? Literally everywhere, and I'll just give a few examples, but it starts right with the syllabus. And this is not my whole syllabus, but this is the syllabus for the evolution course I was just talking about. And that just to remind, reminds me to say that a structured, well thought out, well articulated syllabus written around very clear learning objectives and with very clear expectations helps more students and in fact includes more students. Similarly, assignments. Um, if assignments are well thought out, they're very clear. And I'm putting up this slide to just show that you can even um, toggle your assignments to create a learning path for students. So we all know there are certain assignments that work well before students come to class. There are other kind of questions that work well in class. There are other ones that work well as homework, and those can build to exam type questions. It's not just having a learning path, but having really structured assignments so that, in fact, it's not just easy middle and hard questions in these different sort of places but literally the pre-class questions will help prepare them for the in-class questions and the in-class questions in turn will help prepare them for the post-class ones and all three will prepare students to tackle high order questions on the exam so i think that introducing structure in assignments is another place where you can include more students and finally, I'll just throw out group projects. I don't know how many of you are doing group projects or not. And I know group projects are sort of opened up a Pandora's box in terms of challenges. And again, that's not the purpose here. But if you're going to do group projects, the more structure there is around group projects, the more, well, first of all, students like them better, but that'll end up including more um, students as well. So what goes for assignments is echoed in group projects, being really clear about what students' roles are, having periodic check-ins, having very clear expectations and grading criteria are well are ways to make group projects more structured and a more structured classroom is a more inclusive classroom finally i'm going to mention one more um, and then i'm happy to take questions one more general strategy that keeps coming up in the literature to be more inclusive is to provide many opportunities for students to have what I'm calling a ramp onto the classroom, or you can think about it as a bridge onto the classroom, provide many opportunities, particularly for students who are less well-prepared to either catch up or to work on areas that they may be weaker in or that they come into college. I'm thinking about intro bio, so, so high school, where they come in a little less well-prepared. And there's several ways to do this. One thing we have in How Life Works, but I know they exist elsewhere, are tutorials. We call them um, primers or primers. And these are tutorials self-paced tutorials that help students learn skills that are sort of chapter agnostic that sort of go across all of intro bio whether it's quantitative reasoning designing experiments graphing phylogenetic trees probability and statistics and the like and just to be clear what these are and what they're not these are not opportunities to take a topic and run with it so in probability and statistics this is not advanced topics and probability and statistics this I think of as just enough probability and statistics so you understand what's in the book in other words it starts simpler than what's in the book or the classroom and prepares you specifically for what's in it and i think these kind of ramps or bridges can be really really helpful and provide a place for students to go um, and it's great if they're sort of part of the package of the classroom the other way you can provide a ramp and again this comes from the literature is to have a very um, strong visual program um, visual learning is of course many students say they learn visually but visual learning can be really useful um, in, the, in the sense that it includes many students. But it's not just having striking figures or clear figures. It's what they point out is alignment among the, the, the sort of visual language that you're using. So I'm going to pull this example. This is showing um, translation, and this is a figure from the textbook. You'll note that when I go to, uh, this is a 2D animation, so I'm going to go back for a second. That's a still figure. This is a 2D animation. I've turned off the sound so it's not talking over me. Um, this is the same visual representation. So when they toggle between the book and an animation, and this could be the hard copy book or the ebook, they don't have to relearn a representation. This is what we call alignment. Sorry, I'm distracted by the animation. Um, this is what we call alignment between the book and the animation. Of course, eventually we want them to have cognitive flexibility, but when they're learning intro bio, there's no sense introducing more challenges than they already have. This is a 3D animation. And again, I've turned off the sound and the representation is different because it's 3D, but note the colors are exactly the same and the shapes are very similar as well. Again, so they can see the connectedness between them. Here's another kind of visual representation. And you can see on the right side, 
there's that same figure. So this is bringing together figures from many chapters, but we're using the exact same figure. So here are the figures in situ from the chapter, but they come back there. And of course, you can even take this further um, and, and, and put this online. And when we put this online, we can do even more with it. So for example, in the bottom right-hand corner, I'm pointing, but you can't see. I was trying to get my um, cursor. Um, you can see that arrow, and we call that arrow a zoom arrow. But online, what you could do is use this very much like Google Maps. So you know Google Maps, where you zoom in, things aren't just getting bigger, but they're also unpacking detail. There's more detail when I'm zoomed in than when I'm zoomed out. Well, why not just do the same thing with that visual representation of gene expression that I just showed you? That visual synthesis figure can be a visual synthesis map, literally like a Google map. So as I zoom in, it's not just getting bigger, but it's unpacking level of detail. And I can talk for a while about the maps. The only point I'm making here is to, to note that all these pieces of media use aligned visual language, a consistent visual language, and that provides a ramp for students. So they're not, while they're trying to learn content, also trying to understand why a ribosome is sometimes shown this way and why it's shown another way. So those are some, those are the sort of three big strategies I thought of a structured classroom, an active classroom, and thinking about ways to support students who are less well prepared. I would like to end by just sharing some resources that I've collected actually in thinking about this webinar and resources that I've used um, as I've been thinking about ways to make my, particularly my intro bio class more inclusive. Some of, some of my favorite ones are um, this paper from Scott Freeman. This is not particularly about inclusivity, but it talks about how structure and active learning can help to narrow the achievement gap. But then following from that, this is um, Sarah Eddy's paper about looking at course structure and how that um, is, is a, it includes more people. This one from Kim Tanner um, starts also echoes what the last paper showed about structure and the importance of structure in terms of including everybody and increasing student engagement. This is one of my favorite. It's Brian Dewsbury down in Rhode Island. Um, it's not only incredibly well written and incredibly well researched. They have a, he has a lot of, um, of references at the end, and I used actually a lot of the references from this paper in putting together this webinar. So if you're looking for more places to go, this is a great one. It's from CBE Life Science Education. Um, you could also, this is just, again, to remind me, this is a this is from Brown University, and it's their, what do you call it, their Center for Teaching and Learning. And most centers for teaching and learning now include a tab right there that talks about inclusive teaching practices. So you can look in your own school, but you can also look broadly. Um, some are more developed than others, and but they're great resources. They're all shared, and they're all open. And finally, many of you probably saw this. This is from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Just a month or two ago, or maybe January, <laughs> time flies. Um, again, they have they discuss strategies, they discuss different ways. They actually have a little online component on this one. And like the Brian Dewsbury paper, there's some great references if you want to look them up there. Um, so that's all I was going to say. Um, I know we have a few more minutes, and I don't know how it'll work, um, but perhaps I can take a few minutes to ask questions. And well, I'm going to let you sort of um, MC this portion of it and see if you can um, um, bring up some questions in this way. Um, but thank you for taking the time to um, participate in this webinar. Yeah, thank you, Jim. This was great. Um, I would. Oh, it sounds like I'm getting an echo. I'll turn mine down a little bit. Um, please, if you have any questions, submit them through the question window, and we'll address those in in just a sec. So, Jim, one thing I wanted to ask is, sure. I know in recent years there have been um, a lot of administrations who are really encouraging more active learning. Um, are you starting to hear more about this, and do you think other administrations are are starting to message about this to instructors as well? Yes, no, I, I think that's really tr true, and that's a really good point. I think there's, I think the literature shows quite strongly that active learning is a really effective tool for teaching. And I think what the administration is looking for is how are we are we reaching certain learning objectives, and and if active learning is a more effective way of doing it, I think there is a little more push in this way. Um, the one thing I like to say when I talk about active learning is it seems like for many of us it feels like it's something new. But in education, it's not new at all. Um, this is something I've told Will many times, so bear with me. But again, my wife's in elementary ed, and so she works in a K through 12 um, school. And particularly in the elementary school, K through five, this, I, this notion of active learning is not new at all. Active, project-based, experiential, hands-on learning is how they learn, and it's been shown for a long time. So we talk about like new technology in the classroom, and the, the technology is new. 
but teaching techniques and active learning is not new for the educational community, but it seems to be new last five or 10 years for, the bi for college biology. Um, even medical schools, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, really went to more active learning um, format. Business schools, you know, have physics classrooms that are, are leading the way in sort of classroom response elements in active learning. So I just bring that up because it's, it, it's not an, a new thing. It's just new for us, and it's actually a really exciting and interesting way to teach. Um, there's some growing pains, both from the instructor and the students, but I think when people flip over to it, it's, it's, um, it can be actually a really fun and effective way of teaching. Uh, we had one comment come in. Uh, it said, all of, these, all of these approaches seem to address primarily academic diversity and inclusivity with a focus on poorly prepared students. There wasn't a question along with it, but I'm, I'm I guess I'm curious. I'm, um, I think the only thing are there yeah. other ways of addressing things like cultural diversity, socioeconomic. I think you talked a little bit about about that with the window in the mirror idea. Uh, that was what I was going to come back to. I think we have a, a simple way. And again, I'm I'm approaching this as a practitioner, as an instructor. I'm I'm sure there are more ways to reach more people. Um, but here, here's something I know as we as we revise. Every time we revise the biology textbook, we look at representation of figures. That's kind of well known. Um, accessibility is a big part of including everybody and making sure that the resources we have are inclusive, are, are, excuse me, are accessible. Um, that's the second way. And thinking about the examples we choose and where we're getting them from and making sure we're reaching a broad community of people in that way. Those are probably pretty obvious. Um, and if, if any others in this group have um, strategies to share out I'm all ears. Any other questions or thoughts you'd like to share before we wrap this up? All right. Well, thank you all for attending. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Jim, for this presentation. Really appreciate your time. And um, we will follow up with a recording of this to everybody who was on the line and everybody who was not able to attend as well. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Take care.